wanna sleep in Cause I got something to prove I gotta take what I Do you have questions about starting a trucking business? Box truck or CDL, I've done both. I can help you start your trucking business or grow your business so that you can buy more trucks. Use the link in the description to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me. Now let's get to the video. Hey everybody, welcome back to another one of my videos. Today I'm gonna to talk about, first of all, the disadvantages and advantages of power only versus having your own trailer, fuel management and route management. All three of these things are super important. I got my truck back in February and I actually just bought a trailer last week. So I'm gonna talk about, I was running power only and trailer interchange for the first five months. Now I got a trailer, so I'm gonna start running traditional 53 foot dry van loads. First of all, I'm gonna talk about the benefits of power only. If you're thinking about getting into being an owner op, buying your own truck, buying your own trailer, consider these benefits of running power only at least for the first couple months while you're getting started. First of all, there's really low barrier to entry. So buying a truck, in and of itself is gonna cost you anywhere from probably 40 to 60,000 if you're buying a day cab or 60 to 100,000 if you're buying a sleeper cab. So right there, that's pretty expensive to get in. And on top of that, plan on spending at least $20,000 on a trailer. So that's just even more money you're gonna to have to spend upfront to get started. But you don't need to buy a trailer. You can run power only and trailer interchange while you're getting started. The other thing about buying a trailer, make sure if you are going to get a trailer, it's at, at no more than 10 years old. So it's 2022, don't get a trailer older than 2012. And you really wanna take care of your trailer. The last thing you want is to show up to a shipper and have your trailer refused. So try to get a food grade trailer less than 10 years old. If you are going to get a trailer, invest in a good one because you wanna keep this trailer for five or 10 years. The other benefit to running power only or trailer interchange is you won't have to pay for maintenance on your trailer. So if you get a flat tire on your trailer, typically there will be like a roadside assistance that you can call directly from the broker and they will fix your flat tire for you free of charge. So low barrier to entry and no maintenance. The other good thing about running power only is if you have limited parking on the weekends, you won't have to worry about parking a tractor and a trailer. Parking just a tractor, obviously a lot easier, a lot less space required than parking a tractor and a trailer. So if you don't have like a full yard or if you don't have a big driveway or a big street to park on, it'll be, e it'll be easier just to park your tractor on the weekend. So the benefits are definitely there. Low barrier to entry, low maintenance cost, and easy to park your tractor. However, there's two pretty significant disadvantages to running power only or trailer interchange. And what I mean by trailer interchange, so you can actually work with, with brokers like One Way Trailer or any other broker and you can just pick up trailers. So sometimes a trailer, an empty trailer might need to go from Boston to Chicago. You pick it up on Monday, it just needs to be there by Friday. And basically you can do whatever you want with the trailer from Monday to Friday. So you can run loads all week just as long as the trailer ends up in Chicago on Friday. But the disadvantage to that is your where you can run loads has significantly, your area of operation for running loads has significantly decreased because you need to be in Chicago by Friday. So you might have to take a lower paying load that goes directly to Chicago just so you can get the trailer back Whereas, you know, maybe you can get a better paying load going down to Atlanta or going to Dallas. So there are definitely disadvantages to running with trailer interchange. And the biggest one is you're limited where you're going to go. And sometimes you're going to have to deadhead 100 miles or even more to pick up a trailer if you're not in an ideal location. The biggest, most obvious disadvantage of running power only is you're going to get a lower rate per mile when you're booking loads. Obviously because you don't have a trailer, so you have less to offer. So typically what I'm seeing is power only loads pay between like 260 and 280 per mile, whereas traditional dry van loads are paying like 280 to 320 per mile. So you'll be able to make a lot more money if you have your own trailer. But obviously, you're gonna spend more maintenance, you're gonna spend more on the trailer itself. So the big disadvantage of not having a trailer is you're going to not get paid as much. Also, if you're trying to find dedicated work, it's really difficult because if you're finding dedicated work with like a direct shipper, most direct shippers are going to want you to have at least one trailer. I've seen some dedicated contracts come through my emails where they're requiring like two to four drop trailers. So what that means is you have four trailers, one truck, you drop off two trailers at one shipper, drop off two trailers at another shipper, and you just do shuttle runs back and forth. The runs were paying really good, but who has four trailers for one truck? So it just wasn't realistic for me and my situation, but if you do have one, 
or two trailers, then you'll be able to find dedicated work a lot easier. The last disadvantage for having power only is that trailer interchange insurance can be kind of expensive. I think it added like $100 a month to my, my insurance premium, which isn't a whole lot, but it's actually more expensive for me to have trailer interchange insurance than it is just to have insurance on my actual trailer. So I got a 2012 Wabash trailer for $33,000 and I'm actually gonna save money by getting rid of my trailer interchange insurance and just insuring the trailer. So trailer inter interchange insurance can be a little bit expensive. But those are all really the disadvantages. Lower rate per mile, you're gonna have to deadhead kind of far and go to unfavorable cities and towns to pick up the trailer. You're gonna have expensive trailer interchange insurance and you won't be able to find a lot of good paying dedicated work if you don't have a trailer. So with all that being said, if you're just starting out, nothing wrong with doing power only to get started, to get familiar with the business, especially if you don't have a lot of cash up front to buy a trailer or if your credit score is pretty bad and you can't get a loan to buy a trailer. But after two to four months, I recommend look into getting a trailer and work with your local bank. I was able to get a really good loan. So first of all, I tried to do financing through the dealership and it was terrible. They offered me like 10% interest and I had to put down 20% down payment, which 10% interest is pretty bad. So I worked with my local bank who I've been banking with for two years now and they got me a great interest rate, like 5.75%, 20% down and five years. So if you're looking to finance a trailer, try to work with your local bank or your local credit union. Now I want to talk about fuel management. Everybody knows diesel prices have almost doubled in the past year. I know in my area, diesel was $3.60 per gallon a year ago, and now it's $6 a gallon. So in order to manage your fuel consumption, I wanna recommend you do a couple things. And a lot of these recommendations are gonna be if you hire and manage a driver, but these recommendations are still good even if you are the driver yourself. Always check your fuel card activity. I do it once a month, sometimes once a week. Always check for unusual activity. You never know if your fuel card might be charging you extra fees. So for example, if I go add a network on my fuel card, I have to pay $10 just to get fuel. So I always wanna check that I'm going to in-network gas stations and I always check my transactions. You should be able to log on to your online portal and download a transaction report and there it should have all the information, where you got the fuel, what you paid, how many fees you incurred, how many gallons you got. And I always recommend just check once a week or once a month just to make sure there's no unusual activity on your fuel card, especially if you're hiring a driver. You always wanna make sure that the numbers line up. You always wanna know your miles per gallon and you wanna know how many gallons he's pumping because you never know when your driver might be swiping his card for another driver and that other driver's paying him cash. It's never happened to me before, but I can only imagine it's happened in the past. So just make sure that the amount of fuel your driver is pumping mathematically makes sense with the amount of miles he's driving. The other thing I recommend for fuel management is tell your driver where to get fuel. In the very beginning, I wasn't doing this, so my drivers were just going to the most convenient gas station, and I know they weren't worrying about how much gas was. So. Have your, you or your dispatcher tell your driver where to get fuel because he might be starting in Pennsylvania and ending in South Carolina. And I guarantee you, if you just wait a couple hundred miles, he'll be able to get fuel so much cheaper in Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina versus if he filled up right away in Pennsylvania. Even if you're the driver, I still recommend, you know, look at your fuel finder app, whatever app is associated with your fuel card, plan out your route. So look at where you're starting, look at where you're finishing, figure out how many miles you can go until you need to get fuel. And like I said, even if you're the driver, still try to plan out your fuel. It would sometimes make sense just to really quickly get 50 gallons while you're in Pennsylvania, just so that you can make it an extra 300 miles to get down south and get cheaper fuel. You might have to spend an extra 30 minutes stopping to get fuel twice, but if it's the difference between 20 cents a gallon, it's gonna save you a lot of money. A big thing that's been happening with me is idling. From what I understand, your truck is going to burn about one gallon per hour if your truck is idling. Now, if you have an APU in your truck, hopefully you shouldn't have to idle the truck as much as if you didn't have an APU. If you don't have an APU, you have no other option. You need to idle your truck. 
So if you're thinking about buying a truck, try to get a truck with an APU. But if you don't have one, there's nothing you can do. I heard they're pretty expensive, maybe $10,000 to install. It might be worth it, it might not. It all depends on your situation. But if you have an APU, hopefully you or your driver are not idling the truck as much. However, it's been really hot recently and my driver has told me that the APU is just not able to cool the, with the air conditioning as much as when the truck is idling. So I need to take the truck to the shop and figure out why the APU isn't making the air conditioning as cold as it should be. But I wouldn't have even known that if I wasn't checking my ELD and you can actually check idle time through your ELD. At least I can, I have Go Motive, formerly Keep Trucking. And there's a really cool feature where you can see exactly how many minutes your truck was idling. And it also shows you how much fuel your truck consumed while it was idling. So if you are hiring a driver or managing a driver, I recommend check in on the idle time because company drivers, unless they're told not to idle the truck, they're gonna idle the truck because they don't really care. But you as the business owner, you definitely wanna make sure that if you have an APU, they're using the APU and not idling the truck for two reasons. One, like I said, you're gonna burn a gallon of fuel an hour and that's gonna get expensive, especially on their 34 hour reset if they're away from home. But two, just, purely engine hours. Like that's gonna put a lot of unnecessary wear and tear on your engine. So what you can do is coach your driver. First of all, manage the expectations up front. Tell your driver, hey, the truck has an APU. I expect you not to idle the truck for more than an hour or two during your 10 hour break and more than a couple hours on your 34 hour reset if you're away from home. So be up front with your driver. Tell him to not idle the truck. And then second of all, manage your driver throughout the week. Manage your driver as he continues to drive for you because from my experience, drivers will pretty much do whatever they can get away with. So if you're not bringing it up, if you're not telling him to stop idling, he's gonna continue to idle the truck. So check out your ELD, check out your idling time and see how much fuel you're spending because I guarantee you if you're not managing that, if you're not telling your driver specifically, hey, don't idle the truck, then he's going to idle it and you're gonna burn 10 gallons of fuel every single night. The last thing I'll say about idling your truck is maybe it would be beneficial for you, especially if you don't have an APU, maybe send your driver home on the weekend or maybe pay for a hotel one night if he's gonna be out for his 34 hour reset. It might be beneficial because if he's gonna idle the truck all weekend for 34 hours straight, that's gonna put a lot of wear and tear on your engine and you're gonna spend a lot of money in fuel. That right there is probably gonna be close to $150 in fuel just from him idling the truck all weekend. So you can probably get a hotel for 60 or 70 bucks instead of having him idle the truck. So consider sending your driver home every weekend and also I know drivers love to be home on the weekend so he might actually be happier, you might save money in idling your truck. But if you absolutely can't, just like I said, manage your driver, check the ELD and make sure he's following the rules. Last thing I wanna talk about is route management. Number one, just be upfront with your driver, tell him where to go. Drivers are typically great at navigating the roads and let's be honest, they are the ones who are actually on the highway. So if there's a crash or if there's traffic, they know best. But sometimes drivers have a tendency to not always take the best route. So if you are managing a driver, even if you're a dispatcher, just go over the route. You know, obviously don't insult your driver's intelligence. Don't tell him turn left here, or turn right there, but just go over the route, say, hey, you know, maybe take 81 instead of 95. Maybe avoid this turnpike because you can actually get there faster if you don't take that toll road. Just be upfront with your driver. Just have a very basic conversation right before he steps off after he picks up and just make sure that he understands, hey, you know, I want you to avoid DC traffic and maybe go around the city or I want to avoid all the tolls in New York City. So maybe go around the city. I know it's an extra couple of miles, but I'm okay with that because you're not gonna pay as much in tolls. Just have that conversation with your driver, be upfront with him and manage his route and tell him where you expect him to go. The other thing that's super important is you wanna make sure you have a good GPS in your truck. I was using the Trucker Path app for my iPad and I got some feedback from my driver. He didn't really like it. He felt like it was sometimes taking him on not the best route. So I said, okay, hey, if you don't like this GPS, I'm fine with it, so I got him a Rand McNally 7-inch GPS, and I think he likes that a lot better. So listen to your drivers. If your drivers are unhappy with the current GPS they have, they're gonna get frustrated. They're potentially not gonna be as safe when they're driving. So listen to your drivers. If they want a new GPS, if it were me, I would go out of my way to get my driver the absolute best GPS that he can have. Because ultimately, if he's happy, if he's driving efficiently, then he's gonna get there on time. He's gonna save you money on extra miles and fuel. So just listen to your driver, 
and maybe spend an extra couple dollars to get them a really nice GPS. So like I said, tell your driver which route to take and then also make sure your driver always asks you or at least tells you before he goes off route. Too many times before the next day I've checked the ELD and I saw my driver went like 70 miles to avoid something or go to a different town or a different city and I had no idea about it. And that's incredibly frustrating as a dispatcher and as an owner whenever your driver is going rogue and going off route on his own. Sometimes it's legitimate and he's avoiding traffic. But what I always want is just really good communication with my drivers and my dispatchers. So I just always ask, hey, you know, generally you're going to be allowed to take the alternate route, but I just want to know before you do it. That way I can keep track of it. That way I can talk to the broker like, hey, my driver's going to go an extra hour out of the way to avoid this certain situation. So he's probably going to be an hour later. Just have good communication with your driver, your dispatcher, and your owner. Always make sure your driver just at least lets you know in advance before he makes an alternate route or ask for permission before he does it. Okay, the last thing that you need to do as a dispatcher or as an owner, or even as the driver, as the owner operator, is you need to track your miles. So what you wanna do, go to Google Maps or go to whatever software you're using to track your mileage. And first of all, see how many miles it should take you to get from pickup to delivery. So let's just say that's 500 miles to get from pickup to delivery. Now, once you've made it to the delivery, go back, check your ELD, see how many miles it actually took you. So it might have taken you actually 550 miles to get from point A to point B. Now, if you are a dispatcher or an owner, I would track those miles, take the percentage variance that you have. So let's just say you went an extra 50 miles out of the way and the trip was only 500 miles, that would be a 10% variance. Anytime my driver goes above 10%, I always make a point to ask him what happened. If he's going 500 miles and he goes 25 miles extra from what was expected, not a big deal. Maybe he was coming on and off the highway. Maybe he made one wrong turn. Extra 25 miles, extra 5% variance, not a big deal. But if your driver's going, 10%, 15, 20% miles out of the way, that's a big deal. That's gonna cost you a lot of money and it's gonna cost you a lot of time. So always check the percent variance, like I call it, on the load and coach your driver. Just have a conversation like, hey, looked like you went, took this highway when the route originally had you taking this highway, like what happened? Maybe he had a legitimate excuse. Maybe he got lost, maybe he got confused, but it's up to you to track the miles. So see how many miles it should have taken him, see how many miles it actually took him. And I promise you, if you track those miles, if you coach your driver, then you will save a lot of extra money on fuel and you'll get to your loads a lot faster. Mm -hmm.